Case study problems appear on exam 3. Many students have not had to work this problem type before and they have difficulty navigating them. In these problems you'll be given some clinical data along with normal values and asked to supply the most likely diagnosis. You'll need to match the clinical values with what you've learned about disease states. It's the reverse of the way we teach it to you. When we teach you, we give you the disease and then tell you the symptoms. In the exam situation, we give you the symptoms or the lab values and then you supply the disease. Also, remember that there are only three categories of clinical problem solving questions on exam three. Questions about red blood cells, questions about white blood cells, and questions about platelets and clotting factors. Let's consider each of these in turn. If the question is about red blood cells, ask yourself these three questions. First, are there a normal number? If there are too many, it's called polycythemia, and there are some polycythemias you should know. If too few, it's anemia. Note the meaning of the words. Polycythemia means too many cells in the blood, while anemia means not cells in the blood. If it's an anemia, it might be of nine possible types, three possibilities for cell size and three possibilities for hemoglobin content. Three times three is nine. As we'll see, the reality is simpler, but there are nine theoretical possibilities. Red blood cell size is measured by the mean corpuscular volume, or MCV. This characteristic is the size, followed by the suffix cytic, macrocytic, microcytic, or normocytic. Red blood cell hemoglobin gives the cells their color, so we use the suffix chromic, hyperchromic, hypochromic, or normochromic. We measure this with a mean cell hemoglobin or mean cell hemoglobin concentration, MCH or MCHC. MCH is independent of cell size, MCHC is dependent upon it. Let's go. Let's go back to polycythemia, too many red blood cells. There are two types. Relative polycythemia occurs when the volume of plasma decreases, leaving the red blood cells packed more tightly than normal in the blood. This can happen in dehydration, for example. Absolute polycythemia is when the volume of the blood is normal, but the number of cells is too high. This can be primary, in which case we call it by the Latin word for true, polycythemia vera. Or it can be because of an adaptation to chronic anoxia, in which case we'll call it secondary. Now for the anemias. Remember that we have three possible size ranges and three possible ranges of hemoglobin content. That would give us nine possibilities, but luckily for us, we can simplify matters for this course. If you want to study hematology, you can make it more complicated later. Notice that we can really ignore the MCH or MCHC and focus on the cell size, microcytic, normocytic, or macrocytic. Microcytic anemias occur because of a lack of iron to make heme, which makes the cells hypochromic as well, or because a drug or toxin such as lead interferes with iron incorporation into hemoglobin, which also results in hypochromaticity. Either way, microcytic hypochromic anemia results from interference with normal hemoglobin synthesis. For our purposes, if cells are normocytic, they're normochromic as well. Normocytic normochromic anemias result from destroying red blood cells before their cell by date, or from leaking red blood cells, or from conditions which stop or slow bone marrow production of red blood cells, such as anemia of chronic disease, ACD, or aplastic anemia. Finally, if red blood cells are macrocytic, it's because of a nutritional deficiency. 
Either the patient has a B12 deficiency or a folic acid or folate deficiency. You may be given additional lab results to help you distinguish between these. Now let's turn to lab values which indicate problems with white blood cells. Remember that we studied the complete blood count or CBC which is a scattergram of cell characteristics. Also, recall that different cell types end up in different places on the scattergram and the computer analyzes these for you. The computer will also tell you whether the values deviate from normal. Normally, a patient should have between 5 and 10,000 white blood cells or leukocytes per cubic millimeter. If it's a bit higher, that indicates the body is fighting infection. If it's a lot higher, that's leukemia. If it's lower, that's a serious illness such as AIDS, in which case we can see that the, red, the white blood cells are being destroyed. It's also possible to have a normal total white blood cell count, but have an odd distribution of white blood cell types because of disease, so we need to look at the percentages of each WBC type as well. In particular, we're interested in neutrophils, which primarily respond to bacterial infections, lymphocytes, which we mostly see elevated in viral infections, and eosinophils, which respond to allergens or parasites. Remember that in the words of immunologist Linda Clayton, neutrophils dive into pus and die. They're the cells that get tasked with responding to bacterial invaders. We're going to ignore basophils. Eosinophils are elevated in allergies or in parasitic infections. Lymphocytes are high when we're fighting a virus. If there are elevated lymphocytes, the exam question may also include additional data which tells you what type of virus you're dealing with. If the white blood cell count is really high, let's say 20, 30, 40,000 or more, then you're thinking leukemia a kind of blood cell cancer. There are two possibilities. Either the onset is sudden or acute or the onset is slow or chronic. We take those words and pair them with a predominant cell type, either granulocytes and monocytes, cells of the myeloid lineage, or lymphocytes. Two times two is four and there are four leukemias we're studying. Acute myelocytic, chronic myelocytic, acute lymphocytic or chronic lymphocytic, CML or chronic myelocytic leukemia is most common in middle-aged and older people while ALL, acute lymphocytic leukemia, is the most common type in children. Now here's something confusing. There's a disease called multiple myeloma that has nothing to do with the myeloid cell line despite its name. It's a disease of too many lymphocytes. Multiple myeloma reminds me of the Muppets. Lots of M words there. It's brought to you by the letter B. Myelo means bone marrow, which starts with B. It's an overproduction of B lymphocytes, and those abnormal B lymphocytes make Bentz Jones protein, an aberrant type of antibody whose eponym starts with B. Whew. Let's finally look at clotting disorders. Clotting is the job of platelets. Just like the other cells we're considering, we can have too many, too few, or the right number of platelets. Too many is thrombocytosis, too few is thrombocytopenia. It's your responsibility to study and remember the clotting pathways before you sit down to take the exam. We don't spend much time on them in class, but we still ask questions about them. Just to give you an overview, there's an intrinsic pathway, which is activated by damage to the lining of blood vessels, and an extrinsic pathway, which is activated by damage to connective tissue. Those are oversimplifications, but they'll get us close enough for now. We measure the workings of the intrinsic pathway with the activated prothrombin time, APTT. We measure the function of the extrinsic pathway with PT slash INR. 
The common pathway is activated by either or both of these and ends up with the formation of a clot. We can stimulate the common pathway directly with snake venom. Also review the material on diffuse intravascular coagulation, or DIC, which is both bleeding and clotting at the same time. I hope this presentation will, get, will help you see how to approach the clinical problems that you're given on the exam. Remember that you're looking for abnormalities in red blood cells, or in white blood cells, or in platelets and clotting factors. Once you do that, it'll get you started down the right path and direct your clinical suspicion towards the right disease.